Good evening. Welcome to this meeting of the Foundation for Science and Technology. It's our first meeting since the summer break and it has had particular interest with a lot of people wanting to join us today because our topic is so important. Uh, back in July, the government uh, and produced its R&D roadmap, an exercise led, of course, by Amanda Soloway, the Minister for Science, who's joining us today. And it had a section particularly on the important agenda of levelling up R&D activity across the UK. And that is what we are going to focus on today. It's a very important issue. It's where science and R&D uh, intersects with one of the government's overall priorities of levelling up across the UK. Uh, let me first just talk a bit about practicalities, because after we've heard from our speakers, uh, let me, we are very keen, of course, to get Q&A. If you want to make a point or ask a question during the discussion ses session, do use the Q&A function. You can start using it uh, through, from now. You can use it throughout. Type your question and press enter. And you can also comment on other people's questions and upvote them. And something that will guide me as chair is if it's clear that there's a question that's getting a lot of upvoting, we'll certainly try to put that to our speakers. And we've got the hashtag uh, at FST Roadmap. Now, we have three excellent speakers. Our first speaker is Amanda Soloway, MP. She is the Conservative Member of Parliament for Derby North. Uh, she's been MP for Derby North since 2019 and also had a stint there before 2015 to 2017. She has served as Minister for Science, Research and Innovation since February 2020. And Amanda, you and I can agree it is a fantastic job and it's great that you're doing it. Uh, you are very, we know how personally you committed you are to the levelling up agenda. And now I'm delighted to hand over to Amanda Soloway, uh, Minister for Science. Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, David. And yes, we both know how fantastic this, this, uh, this job is. And it is wonderful, genuinely, to be here today to talk to you about one of our greatest and most significant challenges, which is the levelling up agenda. And I think most of you will be able to tell from my accent that I'm not from down south. And as you probably also know from my bio, uh, I don't have a degree. In fact, I very sadly left school after my A-levels without really having any major success in them. Um, but subsequently, I spent my whole career in a variety of businesses and latterly in, in politics. And therefore, that, that means probably I'm somewhat quite unique as far as science ministers go. However, science and research has always been so incredibly important to me. And I've had a lifelong fascination with engineering, inspired by the wonders of the Industrial Revolution, which I've bored my children with for many, many years. Um, and they stood the landscape of the Midlands, um, from the Grand Central Railway to Ironbridge, and indeed the amazing silk mill in Derby, which I'm reliably ensured was the first ever uh, factory in, this, uh, the, in the UK. And had I focused more at school, I do believe that I may well have ended up um, in a career in engineering and continuing that great Midlands tradition. So science and innovation have always been something that matters a great deal to me. It's an agenda which is genuinely close to my heart and one which shapes and defines me as a person and also as your Minister for Science and Research and Innovation. And I've never, anybody who knows me knows I've never shied away from innovating throughout my career. And I've tried to foster creativity and innovation in all of the places that I've worked. And throughout my life, I've had this a great deep appreciation of just how crucial science and innovation are to our future as a country. And it's uh, been confirmed by what we've all seen in these last uh, six months or so. So from amazing partnerships between the University of Liverpool and Unilever on new materials for industrial processing uh, to climate research that's being done by the British Antarctic Society, who I visited uh, recently, and they, they talked about the studies of 50,000 year old polar ice. And I actually got to hold some in my hand, hold it up, and as it melted, I listened to air from 50,000 years ago. And that is just so incredibly exciting. 
and th these are vital programs that we do, not just for economic benefits uh, that they bring, but also for tackling major challenges such as climate change that face the world. So science, research, innovation help us build a better world for the future. And I truly believe that. And of course, this does have an impact on everyone in the way that we, ways that we often take for granted. Um, I can remember my first ever calculator, uh, which I have to say was a big advance from the slide rule that I used for my O-levels. Uh, and my granddaughter will grow up surrounded by technolo technology and these technological wonders, which when I was a child could only have been found in, in science fiction in the pages of uh, Isaac Asimov. So, Science innovation will also allow us to build, I honestly believe, a more sustainable world. It will give us a safer world and it will give us a fairer world. And underpinned by the new knowledge and its amazing value and impact on the world. But while we are all surrounded by the wonders of technology, we must not forget that for many people, our research and development sector is an unfamiliar place. And it's a totally different walk of life. It's seen as a sector that enriches the major cities in London, the Southeast, but leaves little for the rest of the country. And I want every person in my constituency and throughout this country to be touched by the advances in science and technology. But the challenges and opportunities in Derby are very different to those in Oxford, Cambridge and London. And so I'm calling on you as scientists to better understand the range of challenges and opportunities across the entire country. And this includes having a better understanding of the lives led by people from more diverse backgrounds that are represented in your profession. And I want you to put your minds to research projects which directly address different people's needs. Put simply, we need to renew the social contract for research. And this means doing two things. First, we need to make it as easy as possible, as attractive as possible for people to, uh, for the results of our scientific and research system to be translated into better jobs, uh, better products, better services, and for a better quality of life for more people all over the UK. And for this, we need to work together to foster a rich and vibrant ecosystem of innovation, uh, to connect research and industry, academics and policymakers, and institutes and civil society. And we'll need to use our, our immense capacity for creating new knowledge as the fuel for our recovery, uh, building our understanding of places into our decision making at all levels, and attracting private investment to deliver growth. And we'll also need to look at develop the models of training and skills that allow more and more people uh, to benefit and a more vibrant knowledge economy and to participate in it. And second, we need to deepen the interaction between science and society. And this means for me seizing every available opportunity to inspire even more people about the incredible work that we're doing in the UK, building excitement about the amazing things that we're doing and engaging people in work, whether that's the families and communities who are affected by science or the people who can enrich our understanding of issues or those who stand to benefit most from more inclusive engagement. And I believe we need to build trust in what we're doing because in this age of flat earthers and anti-vaxxers, it's ever more important that we build trust in the knowledge that comes from science and research and build mutual trust between those doing research and those affected by it. The critical success factor is your vision. It's your enthusiasm and it's your application. Let me turn to an important point. It seems to me that some people involved in science who remain deeply bought into notions of exclusivity. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a real value in wanting to be the best and in taking bold action to ensure that we can be the best and can succeed in the UK. And we must never, ever undermine that. Indeed, in my view, we must strengthen it. But by obsessing over narrow indicators of success, we run the risk that overfunding and assessment systems become disconnected from the diverse needs of our nation. And we risk neglecting the contributions that so many people make to our R&D sector all around this country from lab technicians to administrators, from industry staff, scientists and technologists to innovators in all walks of life, to those adopting and using technologies as well as those inventing them. 
and the local leaders and institutions around the UK who have the networks and insights to bring, to, uh, bring our R&D system to life. It's absolutely vital that we now start to harness the potential of more people across our R&D system. And to do this, we need to include different sorts of people from all sorts of places in our discussions. We need to collaborate across boundaries and borders to find the best solutions. And that means building better interfaces between government, funders, institutions and local leaders. Put simply, we need to be more willing to listen and more willing to work together. And we all need a change of mindset. Now, I know there is more to be done to the levelling of debate and the things that I've just talked about. And we, of course, need to have proper informed debates about the best ways to achieve our aims and the right role for R&D investment. And that's exactly why I've established a place advisory group to help develop our, our place strategy for R&D. But we mustn't forget that levelling up is about much more than straight economics or funding models, all winners and losers. It's about how science, research and innovation can help us to become a more inclusive economy and a less divided country. It's about how we can secure equality of opportunity and embrace diversity and difference. It's about how we can strengthen connections across our country so that more people and places can benefit from the UK's status as a science superpower. And it's about building trust and respect. In short, it's about building the kind of country we all want to be and can be part of. And I'm excited by this opportunity. And I believe that together we can do this. The only way is up for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Amanda. A very powerful challenge there from the Minister for Science uh, to the science community. Uh, now we're our second speaker, Professor Richard Jones, is absolutely the man to rise to that challenge. Uh, Richard is the Professor of Materials Physics and Innovation Policy at the University of Manchester. And that post uh, tells it all. He is both an active researcher and indeed elected as an FRS back in uh, 2006 for his work on polymers and biopolymers. But he's also become the enfant terrible of the levelling up debate and has written on this, notably his Nesta report, The Missing Four Billion Pounds. Uh, he's an advisor on regional aspects of R&D policy. Richard, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Over to you. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss this. It's a subject close to my heart, as uh, Lord Willett says. And what I'm going to talk about draws on the report uh, that, that uh, Tom Forth and I, uh, Tom Forth is a data scientist from Leeds, uh, we wrote for Nesta and published earlier this year. And to start with, I want to set the context. What, what, why, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Well, I think this economic, uh, 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 Minister Soloway's mentioned that the divided nation problem that we have, the UK is a, it is a divided nation. If we look at the, the this is a map of uh, economic performance, productivity across uh, uh, Europe. And what you see from this map is that uh, uh, East Anglia, London and the South East are, uh, you know, prosperous, successful Northern European style economy. But as soon as we get out from there, uh, we find an economic performance that's actually more comparable to East Germany, Southern Italy, uh, or indeed uh, Portugal. So g g going to, uh, to, to the northeast of England or, or, or Minister Skates's uh, pro province or nation of Wales, uh, that th those places significantly underperform. So uh, what does levelling up mean to me? I think this plot sums up what I think levelling up means to me. If we look at uh, what regions put into the government uh, versus what they take out, as it were, current expenditure balance, current budget balances, uh, it's the prosperity of London and the South East that kind of carry the rest of the country, if I can put it that way. And so um, uh, uh, the, we, we've got parts of the country that are, that, that are economically successful and we have a transfer union in the UK and that's as it should be. So, so uh, the public services in, in the, the, the rest of the country benefit from the prosperity of London and the South East. But I think the aim of levelling up should be to improve the economic performance of those places that don't do as well as they could do, that are not performing at full capacity. And, uh, uh, you know, perhaps one way of putting it is that, you know, we 
want London and the South East to be able to keep more of their own money. It's not a question of, uh, of, of continually spreading that around. So I think uh, it's about uh, levelling up the performance. Now, what's this got to do with R&D? Well, if we take, uh, if we look at R&D, we find that it's astonishingly highly concentrated. So this plot is uh, uh, the uh, R&D by NUTS2 regions and um, uh, what you can see is that actually just those top three regions, London, uh, the four sub-regions of London, together the sub-regions of Oxford and the sub-region containing Cambridge, they amount to 46% of all the spending in, in, in the UK. So uh, that, that means uh, that, that those places are very research intensive, very successful knowledge-based economies. But it means to, to go back to what Minister Soloway was saying, there are great swathes of the country, you know, East Yorkshire, Cumbria, Lincolnshire. These are places where people won't encounter scientists. So th th there's a double problem here. Those places are potentially underperforming because they're, they're not getting the benefit in, of innovation. But in terms of that inclusivity of people uh, seeing scientists, people, you know, going to who, meeting parents at school gates who are, who are in scientific jobs, that doesn't happen in great swathes of the country. Country. Now, what's the relationship between uh, research and R&D? Well, there are, uh, it, it's not, uh, R&D isn't the only thing that matters, it's not the only thing that, that determines it, but we can see there is a correlation between uh, how productive a place is in terms of its GVA per head and the R&D spending. And, you know, it's a complicated business. The direction of causality there is, uh, it, 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 the, the linkages are complicated. Talk about that in the report. But nonetheless, I want to point out, it seems that, that, that um, we're not giving the, the places that uh, need to be, uh, that, that, that would be good if they were more economically productive, that would translate into better jobs, better wages, better quality of life in all kinds of ways. Uh, R&D is one of the tools that we have to help places become more productive, is concentrated in the places that uh, already are very productive. So if we talk about levelling up, what's the scale of the problem? And I want to talk, to, to, to talk about scale because I think it's important. So if we take the London, the South East, East Anglia, that prosperous bottom right corner that behaves like a Northern European economy, uh, that, that behaves like, you know, the, the most prosperous bits of Germany or, or, or the Benelux countries, there we're spending about £220 per person on public R&D. But if we look at the rest of the country, the North, uh, the, the Midlands, the South West, Wales and Northern Ireland, they're all uh, really less than half that. So what would we need to do to fill up the gap? This is a very crude calculation. I don't actually think this is how we should do it, but I think it's important to sense the scale of the problem. But what that means is the extra revenue spending that we would need to level up is as follows. We'd need 1.6 billion per, per annum more in the north, 1.4 in the Midlands, 570 million in the southwest, 660 million between Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland actually does okay. Scotland or, do, do, does receive about as much as, uh, as the southeast. And that gives us a total of 4.2 billion. And that's where the missing 4 billion title of our report comes from. Now, I want to set that number in, in, in context, and here are three other numbers to compare it with. UKRI's budget last year was 7 billion. So this is a large number compared to the existing science budget. But the government has committed itself, again, the Prime Minister recommitted a couple of weeks ago in his speech on skills, to increasing that to 22 billion uh, by uh, 2025. So four point two billion, it's a big number, but it's not a stupidly big number in the context of the government's um, uh, intentions. The other number is uh, how much money the English RDA spent on innovation. You know, we've had attempts to level up before, if I can put it that way. So the Labour government in the 2000s uh, tried to give money to, through the RDAs. But the point is the sums were too small. It was ineffective. It didn't make a difference. They didn't try hard enough. And so I hope this time we will try hard enough and we'll get the result we want. I want to uh, split out the difference between what the private sector spends and what the public sector spends, because I think this is really important. So this plot here shows on the x-axis how much the private, the, the public sector spends, if you like, government, HE, non-profits. Uh, and on the other axis, I've got the, how much 
private sector puts in. Roughly speaking, over the country as a whole, the private sector puts in about twice as much money. So for every pound that the public sector puts in, the private sector puts in two pounds, and then it's that two pounds that, if you like, go to produce new products, new services, to make processes more efficient, to deliver uh, the, the, the innovation benefits that we expect from science. Now this plot we can see, there's actually four kind of quadrants we can look at. In the top right, you've got places like East Anglia, where we've got a very high public sector spending on uh, R&D, but then the private sector puts in even more, even disproportionately large. So these are great places. These are the kinds of economies we want to emulate. So Cambridge is a fantastic city. We'd like it to be bigger. We'd like it to be even more successful, but we'd like to see other places that are like Cambridge. So levelling up shouldn't be about taking money away from Oxford and Cambridge. Those places are great. They're fantastic for the country. It's about how can we get places that uh, approach that, 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 that can emulate that success elsewhere. Uh, in, in London and Scotland, we have a kind of interesting situation where the public sector puts a lot in, but the business sector doesn't yet seem to match it. So I, there, I think the focus needs to be, what can we do to drive up business R&D? And that could be about translational research, better connections with the public research base. The top left, I think, is particularly interesting, and Minister Soloway's uh, constituency of Derby is very typical here, actually, because in the East Midlands, what you have is rather high private sector investment in R&D, but the public sector not really following it. So I think this is a place where there's a really compelling reason. In a, in a sense, the market is giving us signals about what sort of research ought to be done. And there's a really strong case for the public sector to follow that, to make sure we get all the benefits of those innovation economies, to make those innovation economies that are already quite strong, make them even better. That leaves uh, uh, in the bottom left places which have relatively weak innovation economies, both in the public sector and the private sector. And here, Wales, I'm afraid, uh, Minister Skates' uh, 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 nation is one of those places. Here we need to build capacity. I think it's really important that we need to build up capacity here. It's slightly more difficult to do because we've got to make good choices. We can't do everything in these places. We've got to say, what, what are we going to focus on? Actually, Northern Ireland, I think, is a, a great example. Northern Ireland is actually creeping up into the top left quadrant. Uh, that Their work in Belfast from Queen's University and working with the city has spun out a great cluster in uh, cyber security and other digital things. And that's led to really large increases in business R&D uh, already. I think Wales shows us the way too. I think, for example, uh, we've seen a compound semiconductor um, cluster grow in South East Wales. That's been supported by the Welsh Government over a, a, a decade or so through schemes like Ser Cymru, using the uh, European money to, to, to create translational research centres. So I think it can be done, but it needs more care. So uh, what do we need to do about it? I think there are three things. I think we do need to devolve R&D funding to the nations and cities and regions of the UK. I think we need to take some of that money and use the local knowledge that we have in cities and nations to, 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 to work to decide you know, what the right priorities are for those local nations. So that's bringing in the local leaders that Minister Soloway so rightly uh, pointed out have need to have a bigger role in this. It does need, I think we do need to work to build the capacity in in those places to make those good decisions. I think this is less of a problem in the devolved nations. I think that capacity largely does exist, but in cities and regions, because of the way that uh, English devolution has been unfolding, that's more, uh, that, that needs more work. I think we do need new R&D institutions. I, I, I think we need more capacity, if you like. We need places uh, to, to, to do this. I think given uh, there's a consensus, which I think is right, that the UK actually needs to put more emphasis on translational research. So it would make sense to focus that on translation research. And I think there's some interesting ideas about innovation districts, manufacturing innovation parks. So in my time in Sheffield, I was privileged to spend a lot of time working with Keith Ridgway to develop the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, bringing in inward investment, I think a, a, a story of success uh, about how one can uh, uh, 
building manufacturing expertise and I know uh, uh, Minister Skates is involved in the, uh, the, the, the outpost of AMRC or the, the new facility in Broughton uh, connected to Airbus. So I think uh, that, that there's some knowledge there about how to build clusters that we should use. And then finally I think we do need a bit of culture change at UKRI in, in our funding agency. I think at two levels, I think we need some actual formal representation of the nations and regions in the governance structures and the advice structures of UKRI. And I think we need more place-based funding instruments to build that capacity, like the Strength in Places Fund. So with that, thanks very much. And so thank you for, for, for that. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. And that evidence uh, especially that quadrant, which I'm sure we will return to, very much complements the challenge we had from uh, Amanda, Minister Soloway, earlier. Uh, now we're going to hear from Ken Skate. Ken has been the Labour member of Senate for Cluid South since 2011. And since 2018, he's been Minister for Economy, Transport and North Wales. Uh, and I have to say, I remember Ken coming to speak on a very similar theme at the Foundation of Science and Technology uh, alongside Greg Clark when Greg was the Secretary of State. And I must say then what the sense that they were, the mutual respect and the shared commitment to this agenda was, was very strong. And so uh, Ken, you are welcome back, over to you. Lord, well, it's David. It's absolutely brilliant to be with you this evening, and uh, it's just a shame that it's uh, that we're discussing this issue uh, through a camera lens and uh, on a screen rather than in person. And uh, the last time that I spoke to the foundation, it was with Greg Clark. He was a superb Secretary of State. I thoroughly enjoyed working with him, and I'm looking forward to working with. Amanda, um, I'm really pleased that I'm a speaker alongside Amanda this evening and of course alongside uh, Richard, hopefully providing uh, a Welsh perspective on the R&D roadmap and, roadmap and what it could mean for research and innovation here in Wales in the context of levelling up. And I'd like to thank everybody who is listening and watching this, ev this evening's uh, discussion. I'd like to start though by saying that I'm extremely supportive of any attempt by the UK government to level up. This is something that we as a Welsh government have been talking about for many years because there are a number of areas from rail infrastructure to R&D where patterns of investment in important areas of the United Kingdom are uneven and unfair. And this isn't a party political point at all. There's been a need to level up for decades. And uh, as Richard's already outlined, outlined many previous governments at Westminster have made positive no noises and some effort to try to tackle the UK's regional inequalities. But sadly, nothing has really changed the stark fact that the UK remains the most regionally unbalanced economy in Western Europe, according to figures from the OECD. It's not just that policy hasn't worked, we're going backwards. The Financial Times uh, recently reported that regional inequality in the UK has now returned to the same level that it was at in 1900. And that's why any future attempt by the UK government to level up has to be both meaningful and of sufficient magnitude. Now, the Welsh government's view is that genuine levelling up can't simply mean a sprinkling of new projects decided in, in London. It's got to be part of a strategic approach to promoting growth in all areas of the UK. It's about deconcentration as well as decentralization. It can't just be about equality of access e either, merely the ability to bid in to new funding sources. It's got to be about outcomes and a genuine attempt to narrow the real world gap in terms of investment between Wales and the rest of the UK to support increasing economic growth and prosperity. And this requires a degree of positive discrimination to counter the inbuilt advantages of areas that are already strong that Richard's identified this evening. And leveling up has to be something which meaningfully involves devolved governments in the design and governance of its approach. And I think we all agree that these inequalities matter. As the Industrial Strategy Council and recent Nesta reports concluded, they prevent the UK economy from realizing its full potential, prevents individuals in many parts of the nation 
from reaching their full potential as well. And they blight people's life chances. They've created a widespread sense of alienation and frustration, particularly here in Wales, and especially in deindustrialized areas. And I'm afraid to say that if they continue, they may even risk destabilizing the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So that's why I welcome the UK government's recognition of the need to help the less prosperous nations and regions of the UK. I'm also encouraged by the move towards a place-based approach to R&D funding. It's something that we've been promoting here in Wales since the publication of our Economic Action Plan in 2018. The future prosperity and stability of the UK depends on all parts of the union being able to contribute to an innovative and productive economy. And it can't be right, therefore, that over half of UK R&D spending takes place in London and the southeast of England. It can't be right that Wales receives just 2% of UK R&D investment, despite making up 5% of the population. Historically, this has been justified on the grounds that R&D funding is allocated on the basis of excellence, excellence or competition. But the regions which dominate R&D spending aren't competing on a level playing field. They've been favored by public policy and geographical bias for decades. And I can, give you, I can give you a practical example. Let's take an example from more than two decades ago. There was a debate about the location for the diamond light source. And a strong case was made for it to be located here in Wales, in Aberystwyth, where the university had existing expertise and also crucially access to EU Objective 1 funding. Sheffield, another objective one area, was also suggested. So to the northwest of England, I think it was uh, Daresbury in Cheshire, not far from where I live here in Wales. So Diamond could have gone to any of these three regions and made a massive difference in terms of economic growth and making them more attractive as places for further investment. But instead, it ended up near Oxford, a place in no particular need of leveling up at that time or indeed now. And this isn't an isolated case. And I think it would, it would surprise people in other countries. I think they'd consider this somewhat odd because there are many examples in Europe and in the US of major research facilities being built in regions which needed new sources of employment and growth. I know that I'll be accused of special pleading. You know, Richard's highlighted the challenge that we have here in Wales, but as a place to carry out research and to innovate, Wales has a lot to offer. Independent reports show that Wales punches above its weight scientifically. We produce a greater share of highly cited research than you'd expect. We turn our funding into scientific publications more efficiently than most of the world's other small nations. And we're also doing well in the commercial application of research the UK Innovation Survey revealed that more Welsh companies are innovation active than their peers in Scotland or Northern Ireland. But what we really need is the scale to compete more fa fairly on the UK stage. Our research base does not have the size or the scope to deliver to its full potential. While the Welsh government has invested heavily through, for example, the Sir Cymru, the Stars of Wales program to attract new scientific talent, we've had to secure a large share of our research and innovation funding from EU structural funds, as Richard said. And of course, they're now going to be coming to an end. During the referendum campaign um, on EU membership, the, the Leave campaign promised that Wales would not be a penny worse off as a result of Brexit. Now, the UK government must make good on that promise. We want to see a clear commitment to replace structural funds that we are losing on a pound for pound basis. Otherwise, R&D in Wales won't be leveled up. It will be sent, I'm afraid, back to square one. That cannot be allowed to happen. And of course, the issue of money raises the question of who should decide how it's spent, where it's spent. And the Nestor report, which uh, Professor Jones does talked about this evening proposes much more R&D funding should be devolved to the UK's nations, regions and cities. And we agree wholeheartedly with that principle. It's my belief that the Welsh Government is best placed to understand and to quickly respond to opportunities here in Wales, as, as we did with the creation of the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in North East Wales. 
And as the famous saying has it, Whitehall doesn't always know best. A centralized top-down approach to leveling up R&D is inflexible. It's impractical. It'll prevent experimentation across the nations and regions. And also, it will prevent us exploiting synergies between R&D and other devolved issues, such as economic development, transport, skills, and health policy policies. In fact, R&D investment can only be successful if it's part of a wider policy agenda. And in, that, in, in the case in Wales, it's the economic action plan. Even more importantly, the people of Wales expect their devolved government to have a strong voice in the decisions that affect them. And as our first minister has said, the UK will only continue to survive if it's a genuine partnership between its peoples and its nations. Respect for devolution is of paramount importance. And so we in Wales will most definitely welcome a greater focus on place in R&D funding. We want to see a more equitable balance across the UK's nations and regions. And we want to develop the capacity to carry out research and innovation at scale, not just for our own benefit, but to make our full contribution to the UK's long-term growth and prosperity, to help keep the UK together as a union. And so we stand ready to be a constructive partner with the UK government, with UKRI, our universities and businesses to help deliver this vitally important agenda. Thanks very much. Back to you, David. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Ken. And uh, of course, another example of what you're doing in, in partnership with the UK government is the, is the compound semiconductor cluster down in South Wales, which is very exciting. Now we turn to Q&A. Can I invite uh, all three of our panelists to turn your videos on? And I can report that there's a question which is clearly ahead on the voting from the participants. And it's from Simon Andrews, who's at Fraunhofer UK in Glasgow. And he says, when we double R&D spending, will we boldly invest to rebalance and invest the vast majority of the new spending on D? This will lead to more innovative and economic and societal impact. Um, and that, I think, does link in to the question of leveling up because of the quadrant which Richard Jones showed us earlier. And just to add a bit of a twist to Simon's question, you could argue that the really powerful market signal which government and UKRI really should follow was that top left quadrant where there was already a lot of business R&D spend, which we must assume is heavily D, um, but that public spend was behind. Um, and in a way, that's where you could argue the case is strongest and where this other agenda of rebalancing towards more spending on D uh, by the public would, would make most sense. So uh, let's start with you, Richard, and then I'll turn to uh, Amanda and then to Ken. Uh, should, more of the, should the extra money all go on D? And if so, where? I, I think there should be a, a, an emphasis on D. I think uh, uh, it's. Uh, I think that you know the science base is very important, and keeping a strong science base is very important. But I think uh, international comparisons make clear that, that our system uh, currently, the place where it is weak, is in that D thing. I, um, the, so we often look to the Fraunhofer's in Germany, and it's great that we've got a, a, a Fraunhofer in, in Glasgow in photonics, which is a, again a very important important cluster uh, that, that, that's been developed. So I think, you, you know, the, the, the innovation of the catapult centres was very uh, important. I think you know, the, the high value manufacturing catapult centre, of course, I know well from my time at Sheffield, uh, you know, that there, there's a great geographical spread there and uh, the, 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 that, that's good. And you can point to other ones, the offshore renewable catapult, for example. So I, I, I am very sympathetic to this view that, uh, that, that um, translational research is the place to start. Uh, so so I, I, as I say, without wishing to uh, underplay the importance of, uh, of basic research, I think that is important. I wouldn't like to see money taken away from it, but in the context of a rising budget, I think uh, we should focus more on translational research. And then that's exactly the sort of thing where the place-based approach probably is even more applicable than in other areas. Thank you very much. Um, 
Amanda, what what's your view on the on the balance between R and D? <laughs> then give us some give us a private glimpse into the way the place is you know, <laughs> shaping up. Tell, well, us, tell us where it's going. <laughs> well, it's, it's quite. Um, thank you for saying a private glimpse because I'm very tempted to spin <laughs> the screen around and show you all these whiteboards I have. And just to <laughs> sort of put put into context, when we were looking at the. Um, the roadmap, it was really important, and I think I shared this with you before, David, that we set the foundations for the whole of, of R&D, that we have these solid, solid foundations. And we literally, we're in, in this room, we've got a whiteboard, post-it notes, flip chart paper, having a look at what it is that we need to have and to do in order to become a science superpower. And the, the, honest, the truth is, we need to make sure that we have these foundations and then make sure we deliver on all of these things. And that, as you will know, David, is a major challenge. And it's what uh, you know, make, make sort of keeps me, me awake at night thinking, how do we do this? What I would say is you probably know that I'm an activist. And we have to, instead of just saying we're going to do these things, we actually have to deliver on these things. Now, really importantly, you're right, research, we cannot, cannot deny the importance of research. But development is absolutely crucial too. And I would suggest that actually we haven't paid enough heed to innovation. And I think one of the things that we need to be doing is making sure that we are innovative in this country. And that's why we've set up, this, uh, I've got the innovation expert group that meets on a regular basis, because I, it would all be well and good for me to sit here and say we should do this and should do this. But let, let's talk to all of the people who really know. And Richard, your, your, your advice and support on the place strategy is great as well, and I really appreciate that. But let, let's find out what it is we actually need to do. So the simple answer is, we do need to make sure we're doing research. We do not need to do less, but we do need to keep our eye on the goal. We need to make sure we're doing develop, make development, making sure that we're doing innovation as well. I'm very, very ambitious in terms of what we want to do. The roadmap is incredibly ambitious. And I want to, I'm on the eighth floor here at Bayes, and I want anybody who walks down, we've got science superpower on the window, and I want everybody to buy into science. I want everybody to buy into research, development, innovation, you know, We've got to do it. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Ken, Ken Skates. Thank you. I'd agree I, uh, that I think there has to be a particular focus on development. Two centres of excellence have been mentioned in Wales this evening so far, uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre and the Compare and Semiconductor Cluster both successful because there's a particular focus on development, translational research, and it's attracted in both cases significant commercial investment and interest. And I think with that additional focus on development, it, there'd also uh, be other areas of the, uh, the Welsh economy that will benefit uh, emerging technologies in floating offshore wind, uh, the development of advanced uh, electronic systems and cybersecurity, three areas where we're also particularly strong. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ken. And actually the next the next sort of most upvoted question follows on from what you've just been talking about. The, the, the it's about the catapult network. And uh, I'm very proud to have uh, played a role in the creation of the catapult network, which was a, a conservative manifesto pledge of 2010, as well as being proposed by Herman Hauser to Peter Mandelson. And the question really is about the what more the catapults could do. I mean, certainly, as David Bott has pointed out in the Q&A thread, the original catapults were placed close to industrial clusters they were intended to support. You could argue with what we've been hearing from the Prime Minister in the last day or two about the green economy. One of the great advantages of the green economy agenda, when you look at wind power or tidal power, you move away from the southeast uh, towards the coastal areas, carbon capture and storage, uh, even more so to the north. So the question I think to the panel, and I'm going to start with Amanda, Minister, is to what extent the location of catapults could be used as an instrument of levelling up? Well, first of all, um, I, I must say, what a brilliant idea, and whoever introduced catapults really needs to get a lot of praise. No, seriously, it's it, it, for me, it's absolutely crucial in terms of the uh, leveling up and, and place agenda, simply because we need to be embracing excellence throughout the whole of the country. And that is really important. And that's what catapults allow us to do. And, and for, I, I don't know how else to say this, 
but I just think they're vital. And I think business and industry working with research and innovation and development, you know, it's, it's just a partnership made in heaven. We just need to make sure that we continue that partnership. Thanks. Ken, any observations on, on your experience of catapults? Superb innovation. I think uh, additional spokes to catapults to reach areas, geographical areas that are more remote and uh, institutions that are remote from uh, the existing catapults would be helpful. And also, as you've already identified, uh, catapults to take advantage of other areas of economic activity and research, uh, including, it's particularly important to Wales, marine technology. Thanks. Thank you very much. Richard? Yes, I'm I, I, uh, very, very supportive of catapults too. I think, you, you know, I think the network should be expanded. I think uh, that uh, as we do that, I think we need to make sure we get good connectivity between the catapults and, and back to the research base too. So I think we need to, as we build them, you know, we need more integration, more connection with, with, with university researchers, more, more connection with the, the university base, as well as the vital connection into industry. And again, I think we'll find uh, new, I mean, that th there should be new areas. You know, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen at the moment, very yeah. rightly so. Hydrogen is exactly the kind of new technology that we're gonna need to get to get the prices down to, to achieve net zero where you know far be it from me to kind of suggest things oh, no, i will suggest things you know if we have a hydrogen catapult it should probably be somewhere around teesside the humber that's the natural place where where there's a kind of big process industry all ready to, to take that up and then we need to kind of connect that back into the academic base so i think uh, I, I think they're a great innovation and i think we can build on that build the connectivity in all directions through the catapult network with the research base with industry even more and and that will lead the innovation that that we all want thank you very much richard uh, now the next question uh, comes from douglas kell who is now at the university of liverpool and was a formidable head of the biological sciences research council and douglas is is just reminding us and asking about the other side of this uh, science itself he says british science is world leading but four out of five fundable peer-reviewed research proposals are presently not being funded because we spend far less as a percentage of our gdp on science and technology than other major countries uh, leveling up must include leveling up funding uh, and uh, so there's the argument uh, which which is that you know, when I, to be frank, when I got flat cash back in 2010, it was a relief. It could have been a lot worse. But after 10 years, flat cash is pretty tough on people. What are the prospects for going beyond flat cash for the core science budget? Uh, Amanda, what are your views on that? I was just, I was just going to write it, written a note, and it just to myself, and it's like, we've got 22 billion. That's what we're investing. We know there's a commitment to this. 22 billion by uh, 24, 25. Do I need to say any more? Right. right. So that's a very positive reply, Douglas. There is more money coming. The cavalry are coming over the hill. Um, Ken, what's your observations on that? Well, first of all, in Wales, we need those structural funds to be replaced in full. Um, we've got to continue, obviously, to uh, reward excellence. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Everybody's in agreement, but we also have to build capacity in other areas. So that additional funding that's been provided for in the 2020 budget must be used in order to uh, invest in regions and areas where there needs to be greater uh, capacity and capabilities. And it's not just actually, uh, David, it's not just about investing in R&D. It's also about making sure that as we progress a leveling up agenda, we see leveling up in other areas as well. Uh, I'll give you an example of rail infrastructure, connectivity. Um, rail infrastructure in, in Wales has been underfunded to the tune of about 2.4 billion uh, since 2001. That has to be addressed and it's been underfunded because generally uh, decisions are based on best commercial returns and that can't be allowed to continue and that's why I'd, I'm welcoming as well the review of the green book I think that's vitally important so we have to see a leveling up of investment across all departments of government yeah thank you um Sarah Main from from the campaign for science and engineering has got also got a, an important question on this because although we're focusing on the science budget um, she asks, what news of the R&D element of the Shared Prosperity Fund in MHCLG? 
it could be a really positive way to build R&D capacity through infrastructure. So, and of course, remember that in the, in the past, the, the EU doctrine was that excellence was the criteria for their horizon research spend and structural funds for the device for, for promoting leveling up and countries could spend their structural funds on science if they wished. Um, Richard, uh, perhaps I could turn to you first. Where, where does the shared prosperity fund fit in? Well, I think uh, it, it, I, I will uh, recognise um, what uh, Minister Skates has said. I mean, it's clear that the, the structural funds were enormously important in building capacity in those uh, uh, those objective one regions in Wales, but also South Yorkshire. And going back to the success of AMRC, uh, you know, before catapults were were thought of and introduced, uh, that that's uh, uh, the, the 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 kernel of that that great. Uh, facility was brought about with ERDF uh, uh, with structural funds money. So I think it is important that, 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 that whatever the shared prosperity fund, uh, have, what form that takes, it does recognise that, uh, that, that research and innovation is an important part of uh, promoting productivity in, in, in the underperforming parts of the country. So I just think, you know, that clarity is needed. So, so, so it's for um, MHCLG to talk to Bayes and get working on getting that money out the door, really. Yeah, Amanda, how are you getting on with that department? Are, are they <laughs> contributing to levelling up? Yes, I, 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 was, I was just going to concur with what Richard was saying, really. You know, it is obviously it's not, not uh, Bayes, it is MHCLG. But clearly, you know, the conversations are going on. It's important that we all work together. And can I just come back to the original question as well, which was around, around the science as well. And just, yeah. just to reiterate that science is, is, when we use the word science, we're certainly talking about holistically, we are talking about innovation and R&D. We're talking about the whole, um, the whole concept. So, yeah, definitely working together as well. Thank you very much. Ken? Well, we've got Nestor recommending that uh, and advocating that there should be devolution of R&D funding, and yet uh, there are still indications that the Shared Prosperity Fund could actually uh, undermine the devolution settlement. We need to ensure that we don't lose a penny nor any power with the creation of the Shared Prosperity Fund. And so it's absolutely essential that that fund um, provides the uh, Welsh Government with the ability to invest and to make decisions about where the, that investment should go. Thank you. Now the next uh, question from Kieran Fenby hulls gets to the kind of acute sharp end of the dilemma. Uh, he says UKRI frequently state they fund excellence wherever it is found. Is there a danger that this works against capacity building and thus leveling up? Yeah. Do we need to shift away from this model yeah. and consider research on outcomes and impact and outputs? So that is, uh, that is the core of the challenge. Can you look, let, let's start with Ken and then Richard and then end up with Amanda. Ken. I, I agree entirely with that. I mean, leveling up should be about building capacity and capabilities across the country to enable excellence in research and also similar levels of productivity and employment and to ensure that attainment across the nation in terms of education uh, and so forth is equalized. Um, it's not about taking money from areas that are currently excellent. We do not want to damage the UK economy by removing funding from areas of excellence. It's about building capacity with additional money. And that's why it's so important that that additional resource that was identified in the budget is utilized to support capacity building in the regions and nations of the UK that are currently so far behind. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard? Yes, so, so I think two, two comments. <clears throat> the first is that uh, a focus on excellence and a focus on place blind funding, of course, has a self reinforcing mechanism in. And so excellent places get even more excellent. And uh, that, that's a kind of dynamic that it, it, you know, has some positive aspects to it. But if we want to build up capacity elsewhere, we need to think about different kinds of interventions. And the second comment I'd make is, you know, excellence has many dimensions. As an academic physicist, I, I, I want to get the approbation of my peers and I want to, to, to uh, you know, that kind of academic measure of excellence to be well recognised. But I'd also like some of the work that I do to translate into 
products uh, that, that make the world a better place that create that that, that, uh, that, that both improve uh, economic performance but also you know solve big challenges like uh, um, low carbon energy and that sort of thing so i think uh, realizing that excellence is a multi-dimensional thing and we to some extent have some freedom in defining what we mean by excellence other by the outcomes that we want thank you amanda uh, thank you. Uh, I, I actually agree with, with Richard and Ken in, in a lot of what they've said, and it is about solving the big problems, and we need to make sure that we're, we're do, doing that. And um, I think, just to reiterate, and I, I said it in, in my opening remarks, really, this isn't about doing less anywhere. It's about actually making sure that we improve or, or through, throughout the whole of the, of the UK and make sure that we do keep that excellence. And, and, you know, Richard, you're right. It does have many, many dimensions. And we just need to make sure that we're encouraging all those dimensions throughout the whole of the UK. And levelling up, let, let's be honest, it, it's going to be a challenge, but we all have a part to play and make sure that actually we are encouraging that, that excellence for everybody, not just in certain areas. That's what levelling up is all about. Thank you very much. Now, you've been good about uh, uh, answering questions very briskly. So I'm going to squeeze in two more quick questions, but also at the same time, if you've got any final observations, do throw them in. I'm going to start with Ken, then Richard, then give Amanda the last word. And the two kind of mischievous or challenging quirky angles, Andy Neely is saying, if R&D funding is devolved, how do we avoid duplication of effort? He's, he's right. He says in the days of RDAs, there was a tendency for every RDA to want its own local biotech sector. Uh, there used to be a lot of duplication. How, does, how do we avoid devolution leading to duplication? And an ingenious idea from Dougal Goodman, who was uh, the Gavin Costigan's predecessor as director of the foundation, he says, should cities appoint chief scientific advisors? Such appointments would provide a channel of communication from and to central government and give them a link in, of course, to Patrick Vallance's team, which is an ingenious idea. Uh, so I'm going to start with Ken, then Richard and Amanda on those and any other final quick observations. Ken. And you might be muted. I think it would be helpful for cities to have their own chief scientific ad advisors because it would assist to a degree in avoiding that duplication, that unnecessary competition that's been identified. Um, in terms of levelling up, we've been doing this in Wales for the past few years. We've invested in parts of Wales that you wouldn't expect centres of excellence in R&D. We put the National Digital Exploitation Centre in Blaenau Gwent. We've developed... Um, uh, the Global Centre for Rail Excellence Program in the heads of the valleys, specifically to bring wealth creating opportunities to those parts of Wales where there isn't the capacity and the agglomeration that is uh, so very necessary. And, um, and with regard to the question about duplication, I think it also requires partnership across governments as well. Uh, regional governments, metro mayors, UK and devolved administrations, partnership where everybody is treated as an equal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard? Well, I think a, a certain amount of competition and duplication isn't entirely unhealthy. So I, you know, I wouldn't suggest that one ought to shut down the physics department in Oxford because there's a perfectly good one in Cambridge. Um, but I think the key point is about understanding, having a realistic view of, uh, of one's position in the world. And so I think when I talk about capacity in cities and in nations, it is about being able to make those sensible judgments about, well, actually, no, doing a biotech cluster in this particular place just isn't going to fly. And I think uh, the central, so I think UKRI has a role in supporting cities and regions to develop that, uh, to, to develop that understanding and to, 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 to input in that. So I think, you know, I, I, do, I am a, a, a in favour of devolution, but it's not just throwing money over a fence without any kind of uh, dialogue. So I think, you know, it's important that UKRI has a very strong dialogue with the, with, with, with the nations and the cities and regions to do that. Uh, and I guess that goes on to, to, to Dougal's point. I think part cities, and again, this is perhaps more relevant to the English situation. Cities and regions do need to develop more powerful structures to understand their, their, their science and innovation position. And maybe that would involve uh, d dedicated uh, uh, positions of the kind that you, you, you suggest. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Amanda, finally, it's very good of you as Science Minister to, to give your time to this event. Um, any final observations and any advice to people about how they can engage in your development of, a, of an uh, R and yes. place based strategy? So, so thank you. And it's been, it, it has absolutely been a pleasure to, to be here because it's really important that we all do talk to each other and, and, and actually listen to each other. I think that's one of the most important things. And I absolutely do want to listen to people. So please do not hesitate to contact us. And you, you talked about, you know, making sure that we were duplicating. Actually, it's about communication. We must make sure that we're talking to each other. And a challenge that I am thinking about is how actually we grab that information and share information with each other. Because I think if we can share information, then we all move forward together, which would be a really, um, a, a, I think, a, a really helpful thing to do. I guess, I guess for me, um, my, my final thoughts are, this is... Um, David, Lord Willett, she said this at the beginning, you know, this, the job I have is such a privilege, the job you have, such a privilege. And I intend to put my very heart and soul into making sure that we deliver on this levelling up agenda. It has to be done. It has to be done for all of us here. It has to be done for my children. But I always mention my wonderful granddaughter who's 11 months old, and it has to be done for her generation too. So you have my absolute commitment while I'm in this role. I will listen to what it is that you're saying, and I will do my utmost to deliver on the challenges that we face. Thank you very much indeed. What a great note on which to end. I, I'd like to thank our three speakers, Amanda Soloway, Richard Jones, Ken Skates. It's been a really interesting discussion. Our next FST event will be on the 21st of October on skills resilience in a changing world. And after that, we'll be doing future priorities for UKRI, online teaching in higher education post COVID. So we are very busy on topical events at the foundation. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening and particular thanks to our three speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Kate.